a testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission. Let's begin this morning by reciting a prayer from an ancient Jewish prayer book called the Seder. This prayer book predates the birth of Jesus, and this specific prayer would have been a common prayer that men prayed each and every morning. Blessed are you, O God, King of the universe, for not making me a Gentile. Blessed are you, O God, King of the universe, who has not made me a slave. Blessed are you, O God, King of the universe, who has not made me a woman. I am super glad that by virtue of technology, I delivered that last line. Because if we were here on a Sunday morning, I'm sure more than one of you would have thrown something at me. Because I am not Jewish and have never recited this prayer until now, I will not take the time to defend it. But what I will say is this. This prayer is a key piece to understanding what takes place today in Acts chapter 16. But before we get into Acts chapter 16, which has already been read for you, I need to catch you up to speed with where we have been in our journey through the book of Acts. If you remember three weeks ago, I preached Acts 13 and 14, and I covered what was Paul's first missionary journey. I told you that Paul had left Jerusalem. He had gone up into the interior of what is modern-day Turkey, back then known as Asia Minor. He went to cities like Lyconium and Derbe, and he proclaimed the gospel there. In one of those cities, men who were Judaizers who disagreed with his message, hunted him down and stoned him, and they actually thought they had killed him. Paul, in his brazenness and boldness for the gospel of Jesus Christ, decides to get up the day after that stoning and continue to preach the gospel in that city. Testing his luck even further, he decides to go back to the city where those men had just come from and continue to proclaim the gospel there. After a bit of time, Paul finds his way back in Jerusalem, where we have found ourselves for the last two weeks in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council. And what was it that brought all of the leaders from the early church to Jerusalem to have this big, great, giant meeting? And it was this, according to Acts 15, verse 5. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Now we have to ask ourselves, why was this an issue? And here's why. Because people were coming into the family of God, into the church, who weren't like the people who were already in and established inside of the church. They didn't have the same background and religious upbringing. They didn't follow the same rules and customs. And in many cases, they weren't the same class of people. They were considered unclean, uncouth, barbaric, and in many cases, second class and less than. So the solution of Those who had come to faith in Christ out of a Jewish background, what they came up with because they were setting the rules inside the church was that they needed to make the people who weren't like them and were coming into their church just like them in every single way. So what did that include? It included circumcision. But look how the apostles, the leaders of the early church, respond beginning in verse 6. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. 
And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Saved by grace. That is the defining statement in what Peter says in this moment. And what is this grace that Peter is speaking of? It's that the object of our faith is no longer our good works. But now the object of our faith is the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the perfect life that he lived, following all the commandments of the law, never missing the mark, never sinning against the Father, has accomplished for us everything that we need. It is not the amount of faith that saves us, but the object of our faith that saves us. And because of this, this is why we call the gospel the good news. Because we no longer have to wonder if our good deeds will outweigh our bad ones. We don't have to constantly strive so that we can be in good standing with God. We don't have to worry that on that day when we draw our final breath, if we have been good enough to get into heaven. No, now we get to rest in the finished work of Christ. And what a joyful feeling that is. To this, Paul makes this declaration in Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law... No one will be justified. And that is why Jesus can say, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We can rest in striving to accomplish something that we never can. And we can rest in the finished work of Christ. For this is our rest, resting ourselves and trusting in the work of Jesus on our behalf. And in light of this, the instructions to the Gentiles, those coming into the church who are not like those currently established in the church, is this. In verse 19 through 21, it says, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. As we get ready to jump into Acts chapter 16, let me point out a few things for you. And let me do it by asking you a question. At this point in the development of the early church and of the New Testament, what is the only letter that has been written by Paul to one of the churches? I'll give you five seconds to think about it. Your gospel community leader will give you $100 if you answer it correctly. They didn't know I was going to make them do that. All right. There's 13 opportunities. If you said the book of Galatians, you are correct. 
Now let me ask you this. What is the theme of Galatians? Well, it's about being justified by the works of the law. It is about this same issue, circumcision. This was the predominant theme in the early church. And it made Paul crazy. Not only did it make Paul crazy, it made him violently angry to where at the end of the book of Galatians, he said, to you who are promoting this idea that you need to be circumcised along with faith in Jesus, I just wish you would emasculate yourself and cut the whole thing off. And all the men winced just a little bit. Everything that we've covered in Acts 13 through 15 is found inside of the book of Galatians. And inside of the book of Galatians, there are these two verses in chapter 3, verses 28 through 29. Paul says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Now, I want you to think back to a moment that the, of the prayer that we recited at the beginning of my message, which was intended to get your attention. The prayer that Jewish men were praying every morning was, God, thank you for not making me a man, a slave, or a woman. And what is it that Paul addresses here? There is no male and female. There is no slave or free. There is no Jew or Gentile. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That we are all part of the family of God. That when it comes to our justification, us being made in right standing before God, there is no distinction and separation between any human being who is an heir according to the promise. And what a glorious and grand reality that is. One of the reasons I love being a part of Aletheia Church is that there is such diversity in our church that we do not recognize people according to their differences, but that we bring people into the fold and we try to accept and to love each and every person who comes in our doors, not recognizing or differentiating by our distinctives, but being primarily identified as children of God, as children of the King. Now, all of this that I've said in the prayer and these verses in Galatians 3, 28 and 29, are very key and very important to what we see in Acts chapter 16 today. I want you, beginning in verse 11 to look at the headings that you see in each of these sections. Depending on what your Bible says, mine says the conversion of Lydia. Then it says Paul and Silas in prison, which I want you to retitle the slave girl. And then lastly, it says the Philippian jailer converted. And so the question is, what do you notice about these three headings? The very first three people saved in Paul's second missionary journey is a woman, a slave girl, and a Gentile. If you ever doubt that God is weaving together one big, beautiful story, one big, beautiful tapestry out of all the happenings that are taking place in people's lives all around the world. I pray that this encourages you. Let's look at how this takes place beginning back in verse 6. This is what we call the Macedonian call where Paul and Silas have now gone out on his second missionary journey. 
He's going back through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, which is where he was back in the first missionary journey, back in Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. He was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in that area. So they went up to Mysia, and they attempted to go to Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus said, no, I'm not going to allow you to go there. So passing by there, he went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, at this point, a lot of these cities don't make sense to you in any way, shape, or form. I would always encourage you, when you read the book of Acts, that you have four things in hand. One, Paul's first missionary journey map, a second missionary journey map, a third missionary journey map, and a timeline of Paul's ministry and letters. It makes the entire book make so much more sense and come alive in a new way. What was being told to us here, Paul has now gone through Turkey from east all the way to the western side of Turkey, and he is now going to cross over a little bitty body of water, and he is going to cross into Greece. And he is going to come into the city of Philippi, which we see in verse 12, is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. And it says they remain there in that city some days. That means a long time in modern English. And guess what? Paul wrote a letter to this church in Philippi. It's called Philippians. And he writes it about a decade later, sitting in a Roman prison, awaiting trial before Caesar. But now, when you read the book of Philippians, now I hope you imagine in your mind that Paul knows who he's writing to. Like, we get a picture of Paul's audience. We're going to know and understand that Lydia is being written to. This slave girl is being written to. And this Philippian jailer is being written to because they most likely are still a part of that local body of the church. And what we see here in this moment is a phrase that I heard over a year ago and has stuck with me ever since. And that's why when this passage came along, I said, Kevin, I, I have to preach this one because I have been chomping at the bit for a year to get this message out of me. And it's the phrase, inclusive exclusivity. All right? Now, let me define my terms. And I'm going to define my terms using something that the most high of the highest of all right reverends on planet Earth said, the most high of the most high, Tim Keller. All religions are exclusive. But Christianity is the most inclusive exclusivity there is. Now, I would say and add to this, not only all religions are exclusive, but all moral viewpoints are exclusive, but Christianity is the most inclusive exclusivity there is. For Christianity is a religion and a moral viewpoint on life. So even if you are not religious, you have a moral viewpoint, and this applies to you. Now, in hearing this term and in coming across this quote, I found a blog article that I felt, thought was very relevant by a very well-known pastor named J.D. Greer out of North Carolina. And I want to read a portion of it for you in this, um, in this message. The gospel, Paul says, creates a new inclusive humanity that overcomes the divisions created by the pride that comes from distinguishing ourselves from others. I have often shared this message with non-Christians and been met with skepticism. Wait a minute, they say. This sounds nice enough, but you've just said there's only one God and only one way of salvation. That doesn't sound inclusive. That sounds like the definition of exclusive. But there's just something about religious claims that makes them exclusive. All of them. Yes, 
even the tolerant ones. For example, it's popular in our society to say it doesn't matter what religion you believe in. All of the good people go to heaven. And that sounds very inclusive. But here's the problem. If you say that, you've excluded an entire group of people, the bad ones. And chances are, you get to define what is bad. And so very suddenly, your inclusivity becomes very narrow. Our default position is to imagine heaven with all of the people we like and without any of the people we don't like. I can't think of a better definition of exclusivity. And you might say, no, no, I'm not religious at all. I don't exclude anyone for any reason. But you still have your standard as to what constitutes a good person. Religious or irreligious, conservative or liberal, we all have a list. Some people are on it and others aren't. Don't believe me? And he goes on to give an example in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which I think I can equate here in Gainesville and then add one myself. He says, try driving through Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I'll say downtown Gainesville, just east of the university, a place that prides itself on tolerance. Do so in a truck with oversized tire, one NRA sticker on the back windshield, and another sticker telling people you think global warming is a hoax, which is why you refuse to recycle. I'll bet you experience something like non-acceptance. Now, let's say you're on the other end. Let's say you're a Toyota Prius driving kind of person. No offense if you drive a Prius. But on the back of your Prius, you have a Bernie Sanders sticker. And you have a repeal the Second Amendment sticker. And you have a sticker that says, I hate Donald Trump. You go to the more conservative areas of our state and pull up to a small country gas station. And you see how tolerant those people become of you. Every group of people has another group that they want to exclude and they define as bad or Less than. And so back to the article, it says, Your definition of what is good and bad is just as exclusive in Gainesville as any other fundamentalist community in the world. All religious and moral viewpoints end up being exclusive. Everyone has a line for who is in and who is out. Christianity is inclusive exclusivity. It teaches that the only way we can be justified in God's sight is by having Christ's righteousness imputed to us. We're not accepted because of our moral record, our education, our marital status, our race, or our political viewpoint. God gives salvation as a gift to all who will repent and receive it in humility and faith. The gospel says, Whosoever will may come, regardless of the mistakes in your past, your problems in the present, or your lack of potential for the future, you come to Jesus, and Jesus saves whosoever. Church, there are two things that we must hold in tension with one another. Something that many churches do not hold at all in tension. And they only hold on to being inclusive, meaning that they tell everyone that they can come in. That everyone is accepted. And I know this may be a hard message to hear. And and what I would say is, what we should tell people is, all are welcome. If you are out there today and you are listening to us and you have never been a part of Aletheia Church and you're wondering what it's like because your only connection is uh, through this camera, you need to know you are welcome here. Every human being who is drawing breath is welcome here to come and to be a part of who we are and what we're doing and the worshiping of King Jesus. And we want you to know we will walk with you through some of life's 
most trying circumstances. And, you, and we want you to know that we will welcome you, but we also will call you to repentance and to following Jesus. Throughout the scripture, there are standards of conduct. There are standards that we are to abide by. There are ways in which we are to mold and shape our lives. Not because we've necessarily chosen that way, but because God has shown us this is how life is best lived. This is how he expects us to live. Now, we do these works, and you may be saying to yourself, Daniel, you said I didn't have to do any works. And what I said was you didn't have to do any works for your justification. You don't do any of your works to get in right standing with God. But now, because of what Christ has done for you in this moment, there are works that he has created beforehand for you to do, and there are good things that you do in loving brothers and sisters and people around the world, but there will also be sin that you have to repent from and turn from if you are going to faithfully follow Jesus in this newly established relationship that you have. And on the other hand, there are people who... Don't try to include everyone, but they try to be exclusive. And they try to be exclusive because they really want to hold a tight-knit group together. They want everybody to look like them. They want everybody to like the same music that they do. They want them to dress like them. They want them to act like them. They want them to obey all of these religious rules. And they become this little enclave of people, this little clique that binds together and make it almost impossible for anyone on the outside who could ever break in. But church, what we have to hold in tension is that we must welcome and invite people into the family of God. But we must also hold up to the standard of our doctrine, and we must make sure that we don't let secondary and tertiary issues become primary issues. We must make sure that we are continually opening ourselves up and including people into this family of faith, not shutting anyone out because they don't look like us or talk like us or sound like us or think like us. For that is not of the gospel. That is not of the character of Jesus. And that is what makes Jesus such an amazing character in Scripture that Jesus could relate to the most religious person that there was, but he could also sit down and have a meal with tax collectors and prostitutes. Jesus engaged everyone, but he also called everyone to repent of their sin. Let's look at these three characters that God has intentionally placed in this story today. The first is the conversion of Lydia. In verse 13, it says, And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we, were, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. After she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So as a character sketch, we ask the question, who was Lydia? Lydia was a powerful woman. Lydia was a strong woman. She was a successful woman. She was a driven woman. She would have been a woman of great means and great wealth. She would have been at the highest strata of Roman society. And along with that, we see that she was very spiritually interested. So if you're writing down a title for Lydia, I want you to write down spiritually interested. And the question is, how does Lydia come to faith in Christ? Well, basically, she's at a prayer meeting, which would be the equivalent today of an evangelistic Bible study. She was there and she was present. And, and I love how Luke records this. It says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So notice Lydia's part was to be there and engaged, 
Paul's part was to proclaim the gospel. But it is God and God alone who opens the heart of a human being to come to faith in Christ. And the words here in English, to pay attention to, it really has a stronger meaning in the Greek. It's actually the word to crave, like a drug addict craves the strongest drug. That is what God produced in her heart, and this led her to faith in Christ. And so my question to you, as we've been focusing on asking the question throughout this entire year, who is your one, is this. Who is your Lydia? Who's the person in your life who is spiritually interesting? Who is the person that you can have spiritual conversations with, and that if you invited them to church at Aletheia, once we gather again, or if you invited them into your gospel community or where you're gathering this morning, they would come along to listen to the Word of God being proclaimed. I pray that you would write someone down and that you would begin to engage with this person you have identified as your Lydia. Let's look at the next story that I have titled The Slave Girl. In verses 16 through 18, it says, As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And it came out that very hour. And so the question we have to ask in our character sketch is, who is this slave girl? She was the shackled. She was the abused. The trafficked the broken, and the traumatized. And how is it that she gets saved? How does she get delivered from this demon that was tormenting her? How does she get delivered from her captors? Two men had to go into her situation and prevail upon the situation through the power of the Spirit of God and get down and dirty in the mess of her life. And church, we bear this moral responsibility as well. And so the the question I, I want you to ask is, who do you know that is enslaved? Who do you know that is currently shackled to an addiction? Who do you know that is being abused by someone who is close to them? Who do you know who is being trafficked for sex? Who do you know who is utterly and completely broken? Who do you know that has been traumatized by some great hurt in their past? Does God not want you to step into their situation? Does God not expect as you having a good news of the child of the king that you would step into their brokenness and offer them the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I think that he does. And here's the deal. You may be saying to yourself, Daniel, I totally agree with you, but I don't know anybody like this. And that may be a totally fair statement. But let me point you to a few things that you might look into to get involved. And I'm going to point out two women who I know do a wonderful job of this in our church. There's one young lady in our church who has graduated from school, who is right in the midst of her career and pursuing all the things that she loves in her career. And rather than living the good life that we would say, rather than just doing what she wants to do on the weekend, she has decided to take on the incredibly difficult task of being a foster mom. This young lady is single. She could be traveling around the world, except for at this moment, but in most other times, traveling around the world, 
having a good time, doing what she wants to do with her time because she's earned it. But instead, she has decided to step into and to rescue the broken from horrible situations. She is an incredible role model to all of us of one who, like Paul, stepped into a horrible situation. Another young lady at our church who's recently married works at an organization called Creative. Created is here in Gainesville, and it specifically seeks to rescue those who are being trafficked for sex. And this may be a shock to you. You're like, but this doesn't happen in Gainesville. People don't traffic people for sex. Yes, they do. Each and every day, dozens of girls are trafficked up and down I-75 for the sole perversion and pleasure of men who will use them and abuse them. Many of them under 18, some not even yet teenagers. And so there's an organization in Gainesville to which you can get involved, which can specifically, which specifically strives to rescue young women who have been enslaved in sexual bondage. And let me say this, church. Those who are shackled, abused, trafficked, broken, and traumatized, they aren't coming to our church. Why? Because they are broken. They can barely get on with their lives. I don't care how good the preacher is on Sunday morning. I don't care how good our worship music is. I don't care how good our program is. I don't care how good our building is or our location is. People like this aren't coming to church because they don't feel as if they are welcome. They have been used and abused their entire life. And so what we need to do is we need to be willing to step into their situations and to go and rescue them in the same way that Jesus steps down from heaven into the earth and rescues us. We must be willing to get involved in uncomfortable circumstances that may be way out of our comfort zone and expertise. But let me say this to you, have confidence, for is the Lord your God not with you? I pray that God reveals to you a Lydia. If he hasn't, you pray, I mean a slave girl, if he hasn't, Pray that he would reveal to you a way that you can get involved to rescue those who are broken and chained. Lastly is the Philippian jailer. We see this in verses 25 to 34. Because of what they had done in releasing the slave girl, this wound up with Paul and Silas being thrown in prison. And so about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Who might the Philippian jailer be? Who might he be in our lives? I would venture to guess that he was a skeptic. If you know anything about history and about jailers at this time, <clears throat> they were typically men who had served well in the Roman army. This means that they were not young, but they were of an elderly state. They were at the very end of their service. 
They had most likely seen a lot of battles, a lot of war, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of death. And we know that many times these things harden us to the world around us. And so in this position, as he is watching over these and the cell doors fling open, he actually goes to kill himself. Why? Because it was a cushy job except for one thing. If any prisoner escaped, you lost your life as punishment. So in order to save that man's life, Paul and Silas remained in prison. And so the the question I think we ask is, well, how does someone like this come to faith in Christ? That if you have someone who is really hard toward the things of God in their life, how is it that we might learn from Paul and Silas in this moment to see them come to faith, knowing that their conversion may not be as quick or as dramatic? But I think there are two things that we can learn from this story I think, number one, we can learn from the joy that Paul and Silas have in prison. I mean, these guys were imprisoned, one, for doing good work of the kingdom of God. They had done nothing wrong. But yet, what are they doing? Are they belly aching? Are they whining? Are they complaining? No, they are rejoicing. They are joyful. They are singing songs to the Most High God. I'm sure the Philippian jailer had never heard anything like this in his whole life. And he probably thought they were a bunch of nut jobs. But yet, when the opportunity came for them to run and to get out of there, they didn't go anywhere. And what they actually did was they showed that man a great act of grace. Because they could have left, and he would have lost his life. But their great act of grace was them not asserting their rights, not running into the freedom that they had, but remaining where they were as a witness and a testimony to this man who was a skeptic. So if you have people who are in your life who are skeptics, as you sit there and you try to write down who this might be, I would encourage you to do two things. To one, stop arguing and whining and complaining about COVID-19 or any other problem or circumstance that comes up in your life. Because I do find it interesting that it is in the book of Philippians where Paul says in Philippians 2.14, do everything without arguing and complaining. I've often said, if there's one verse that I could strike out of the Bible, that might be the one. Because do you know how hard it is to not complain and to murmur and to bellyache and to gripe? It is super duper, extra duper hard. But yet this is God's instruction to us. Because the problem is when we whine and we gripe and we complain about our circumstances, we're actually bad-mouthing God. And you're like, but Daniel, I didn't even mention God the last time I was arguing and complaining about my circumstances. But here's the deal. Does the Scripture not say in Hebrews 1, 1 1-4 that Jesus is sitting on His throne? Does it not say in Hebrews 2, 8-10 that everything is under the control of Jesus even if it seems as if it's not under His control? So the question for us as believers, do we acknowledge that every person, every problem, and every pressure that is in our lives is been put there, has been put there by the hand of a sovereign God? Do you believe that? And if you do, why would you argue and complain about your circumstances? Might this be the reason why over and over and over and over in his letters, and you can see it throughout his writings, Paul says, rejoice in your circumstances. Be joyful in your circumstances. Have joy no matter what is going on. And to the church in Philippi, he does write this in his letter to the Philippians. Look at what he says in verse 4. And he's writing this from a prison cell in Rome, mind you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. 
I've told you that anytime the Bible repeats itself, it's trying to drive home a very strong point. And so from prison, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Does that mean only when life is good, only when you got an A on a test, only when you got a raise, only when you got the job you wanted, only when you get every single thing that is good and great and wonderful in this world? No, it means you rejoice even when it's hard, even when it's bad, because you and you will find yourself being thankful to God in new and deep and powerful ways. You will find gratitude welling up in you that you never knew was there. Because see, if you recognize that God is sovereign in all of your circumstances, you can let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And do you know that if you do that, Paul says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Church, if you want to stand out as salt and light in the world, be joyful in every circumstance. Take the time to thank God for the people, pressures, and problems in your life. And you will see the skeptics around you dumbfounded and even amazed. How can this person find and have joy in the midst of these terrible circumstances I see them going through? That speaks a powerful word, whether a person is a follower of Jesus or not. Even the hardest skeptic can be melted by our joy in trying circumstances. Church, I want to encourage you to be mindful and to be prayerful and to ask yourself this week, who is my Lydia? Who is my slave girl? Who is my Philippian jailer? And begin to seek to reach them with the gospel of Jesus. And you know what's going to be awesome if we all do that? If our church collectively does this together, that you know we will be a very inclusive, exclusive church in the best way imaginable. Because you will see people from every skin color, from every background, from every upbringing, from every socioeconomic class that exists, we will see this beautiful representation of the body of Christ in Gainesville. We will see people from all nations. We will see people from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation be a part of this church. And you know what? That's what the Bible says heaven is like in many ways. In one specific way, there is this group of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. In church, if we reach out in this way and we invite all to come to Jesus and we get involved with everyone and ask them to come to Jesus, to get involved in their lives, to get involved in their circumstances, to come alongside them and to show overwhelming and great, exceeding joy, then we will see one of the most beautiful things that a person can witness in this world. And that is a diverse body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today, and I thank you for this message, and I thank you for all who have listened. Father, I pray that this message would go beyond my mouth, would go beyond the hearers and the watchers of this video, and I pray that it would go around the world. I pray that it would permeate the city of Gainesville into wherever people are gathered and watching from, and would be used to have an amazing and great impact for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. A testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission, which is to see the gospel in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life.